to the Marcus Hyde. Put your hands together for Marcus Hyde. Thanks for the invitation, Adam. Um, yeah, so. Um, okay, good. So, this one will be less artistic than the last one um, and more formal. Um, yeah, I'm sitting in a computer science department, but I'm doing mathematics all day, but my heart is in physics, um, so <laughs> you really want to know it. Um, and I will talk about uh, the foundations of artificial intelligence, of artificial general intelligence today, um, what that means, what it gives you, I think we can lower the volume a little bit, and um, what it does not give you. Um, so, um, first, um, I'm made of terminology. That's best. Okay, so, um, so the term artificial intelligence, I mean, it has been around for 60 years now and used for many things. And nowadays, often for software which is smart, but not on a human level and not general purpose, but specific, you know, playing chess well or so on. Um, but a new term has emerged, emerged, namely artificial general intelligence, and that refers to um, human level AI, um, in particular, um, being very broad, having all the capacities of a human, maybe on a lower level, but usually it's meant on a, on a human level. So I will use the term AGI. Um, for this type of AI. So first, what is the goal um, of AGI research? I mean, that's to build a general purpose superintelligence. And while it's generally believed um, by many um, that this will ignite the definition core to the singularity, and I will talk tomorrow uh, more about why that should be the case or is probably the case. Um, next is, um, if you want to work on AGI, I mean, there's this word intelligence, and it's a good thing to know what intelligence is, right? And um, in the early AI research, people have tried to figure that out. Um, but somehow they got disappointed and gave up. And there are only very few who work really on, on the core issues of what intelligence is, from a formal perspective. Um, and, um, okay, but what we are really aiming at or doing, um, that's a big question, I mean, you can define intelligence maybe, but what we really want to do. I mean, is it that we want to build intelligent systems by trial and error and hope for the best if at some point it works, yeah? Or is it to try to mimic biological systems? All right, like humans, yeah, we have one intelligent system around here, so maybe just copy human nature. Yeah? And uh, I believe that it's very important to have formal theories of intelligence and artificial intelligence in order to make progress in this field. And I will talk about that. Okay, so the focus of this talk is about the mathematical foundations of intelligent agents, um, the state of the art theory of machine superintelligence, um, and then some implications. And these slides are cut off at the bottom, which is at the moment not dangerous, but um, now it becomes bad. readable. Okay, let's see how far I can get. So, um, so first, what is intelligence? Um, this nice box, you know, um, is very useful. I mean, there are many angles you can categorize um, intelligence. So, um, two, one of the important ones are, is it about thinking processes or about acting? And the other one, is it about so humanness or is it about rationality? And then you can look at these four corners, yeah, and um, cognitive science, for instance, is the field of how humans think. They are studying how humans think. Um, by behaviorism, so uh, alternative psychological theories about how humans act. And also the Turing test in this corner here. Um, it asks sort of um, how humans act and um, compares it to actions of um, uh, artificial system. It doesn't care about the internal thinking processes. Um, okay, that's about humanness. Um, what about rationality? So the laws of thought, you know, Aristotle and following philosophers and then logic, you know, it's about rational thinking. And, um, well, acting rationally is about doing the right thing, and most of AI research nowadays concentrates on this lower right corner. And the reason is, I mean, we want systems which do something. Yeah? You can have this silent thinker in his room, 
um, all day thinking great things, but never doing something or telling you, and well, is that really intelligent? I mean, we don't know, probably, but it's not really so useful. So we need to act, and even speech act is an act. Okay? So the acting part is very important for us, and um, many of us want to build rational systems um, for various reasons. Um, I mean, there are not humans around. Yeah? I mean, they're not totally irrational, but they're not perfectly rational. And um, we hope somehow that rational systems are superior in many um, aspects than um, humans. Okay? And um, so here below, I have a working definition of um, what intelligence could be. And what we did is um, we um, went through the psychology literature, the philosophy literature, and the AI literature, and looked how researchers define intelligence, artificial intelligence, or groups. Yeah. And, I mean, it's very diverse, these definitions, but there seems to be a recurrent theme. Uh, not in all of these definitions, but in many. And if you distill it, you can come up with an uh, informal working definition as intelligence measures an agent's ability to perform well in a wide range of environments. Okay. So, um, this may not sound very impressive and maybe even wrong to you, um, the impressive stuff comes later when I show you an equation which captures this informal definition. So these words actually have been carefully chosen, so um, I will come back to that later. Okay, so um, let me give another distinction um, how we could proceed uh, to build AGIs, and there are so these natural approaches or natural inspired approaches where you take human nature yeah, and copy and improve it. So we could sort of um, try to simulate a human brain, or we could um, um, say uh, evolve intelligent creatures so that's the domain of artificial life. Yeah. Um, and um, so it's brain scan, simulation, scan, and then simulate it, or genetic enhancement, um, or we could augment our brain. And I will not talk about this here. Um, so we're not, I'm not interested in building artificial legs, you know, artificial wings. I'm interested in building a wheel, right? Yeah. This is not copied from nature. Yeah. Or or so. And um, there are various artificial approaches um, which people have tried in the last 60 years. Um, here I've listed maybe the major ones. And there's a good old-fashioned AI approach. It's sort of a logic, language-based approach, which is narrow natural. So, I mean, as scientists and philosophers, we reason, we think, and we use language and logic here. Yeah. So maybe an intelligent system should also do the same stuff, right? So, um, so expert systems came out of this field, um, theory improving, automatic theory improving, and other cognitive systems. Okay. And then there's the economics-inspired approach, yeah. maybe an agent which tries to uh, be greedy and make profit. Yeah. Okay, you can abstract away. So. Um, um, you, you want an agent which maximizes utility, that's now an abstract concept, which could be money or something else. Uh, um, you use sequential decision theory in order to define what optimal actions mean, um, and also game theory, sort of if you have two agents interacting with each other, um, came also be tuned from economics. Um, then there's field cybernetics, um, at least the name seems to be that, yeah, uh, which was um, inspired by engineers. Engineers have systems which they want to control, yeah? and they want to, say, minimize some vibration or some other characteristic. Yeah? So they also have a system and a controller, yeah? and um, um, that's called adaptive dynamic control, uh, which is closely related to the next um, instance here, reinforcement learning, but let me come first to the left-hand side, and that's machine learning. Uh, machine learning tries not to build a system which knows a lot and is smart, but tries to build a system which learns what it needs to learn and then acts smartly. And um, the most useful um, sub-discipline of machine learning for AI is, I mean, there's a lot of machine learning out there. It's applied statistics, if you want to, regression, classification, and this stuff. And is that AI or not? Yes, it gets lots of data and sophisticated model classes. It sort of pushes in the direction of AI and AGI. But, but mostly these people are not really interested in AGI. Yeah. Um, but there's an intersection between sort of classical AI and, and the machine learning approach, and that is reinforcement learning. So the term is inspired from animal research, 
where you put agent which interacts with an environment, and you just tell the agent uh, whether it have done something good or bad, you reward or punish the agent, and then to figure out by itself um, how to act rather in the future. And there's the last paradigm, which is has been underappreciated um, at least since 10 years ago, but it's sort of coming, um, that's information processing. So, uh, and if you think about it, it's very strange that, I mean, what is an intelligent system? It, it gets information and it outputs information. That's an impro information processing system, yeah? So information theory should play a major role also in an intelligent system. And um, in my opinion, actually it does. Yeah? And it does it via data compression. And I will come back to that. Um, so to conclude this slide here, um, I think all of these approaches separately, they're too limited to really achieve AGIs so or human level AI. But if you combine them, but maybe not all of them, but you know, a couple of them, um, then they are very powerful. And I will show that to you. Um, so next question is, well, sort of, I told you I want to well-define the AI problem, I want to come up with a formal theory. But then you say, look at the human brain, you know, it's really complex. Intelligence is a very complex phenomenon. How can you believe, you know, that you can capture this in some simple equations, you know, that should be impossible, right? And I will try to convince you um, that this is a silly argument um, by analogy. Um, so there are many, many simple systems which describe very, very complex phenomena. So for instance, cellular automata. Probably you have seen Game of Life, Conway's Game of Life. <coughs> they have very, very simple rules. If you set it up properly, you have gliders, glider cannons, it's actually Turing complete. You can do everything what you can do with your PC, right? With this very, very primitive system. And it displays very, very complex behavior. Um, uh, some simple automata display very complex behavior. And indeed, sort of all of computing can be modeled by cellular automata. Then there is cows and fractals and all these kinds of stuff. So very complex patterns and beautiful patterns. Um, which are based on very, very simple equations. So uh, the standard number code set is just set equals set square plus C, and it's complex numbers, and that's it. And uh, we get these beautiful fractals out of it. OK, that's maybe still not impressive enough, yeah, but then think about chemistry. Yeah. I mean, probably all the chemistry lessons at some point, you know, it's, it's a mess. You know, all these rules and this complexity, and you know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah? But what is even more amazing is that you can capture everything with quantum electricity. This is a beautiful, simple, albeit mathematically complicated theory, which describes, which can describe all chemical processes perfectly. The problem is it's highly, it's very hard to compute, so you need approximations, and all these effective theories we have learned are not useless. Yeah, they're still very useful. But now you can derive many of these theories and prove them with a simple guiding principle. And the real point is there is a simple mathematical theory which describes all of chemistry. And you know, there, there's no doubt in this line yet. And what I will try to convince you today, is there's also a very uh, simple theory, um, oh, and that is cut off here, the most important line. So we have to do something about it. I change the resolution. Let's see whether this works. Yeah, well, that's not probably the last slide where that happens if it's just the only slide. Um, Can someone go down the back and lift the projector of uh, one centimeter? I think it's not the projector. I mean, it, it, it's yeah. both, but the projector only sort of misses a millimeter or a centimeter, and um, okay, that is hopefully better. <laughs> is this a test? A cool test, or? <laughs> well, the theory is so simple, yeah. Uh, Press escape, yeah. Um, ah, okay. Just, 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 just drag that window to us. Yes, haha, <laughs> okay. I can't see, but you can see it now, yeah. Okay, so, um, so before I, I come to the last line, um, so there's also a, a theory which may be a theory of everything of the universe of all of physics, which is called superstring theory. Yeah, and we're not the physicists are not quite there yet. Um, I 
say we because I feel like a physicist. Um, so, uh, but at least the standard model of particle physics and uh, general relativity are very close to a theory of everything. So that's pretty amazing that you can describe the whole universe in such simple terms. Okay, and today I will convince you, I hope to convince you, that there's a single, single theory um, called IXI, um, which describes superintelligences. Okay. Um, so I will talk about the philosophical foundations of this theory, um, mainly a comparison, a Epitos principle, induction, and so on. Then the mathematical foundations, but I will sort of strip off most of the mathematics, except for one final equation I really would like to show you. And um, then I will come back to the uh, rational agents framework. Okay, so um, Occam's razor. Um, in a sense, that's the most important principle in science, induction, machine learning, and you can even argue by definition science is about applying Occam's razor. So what is Occam's razor? And uh, Occam's razor um, says that uh, if you have two hypotheses, you take the uh, which are consistent with your data, you take the simpler one. Okay. So let me give you an example um, why this is important, this principle. And a uh, famous paradox in philosophy is the Gruemerer paradox. Um, so um, assume you have two hypotheses. Hypothesis one is that all emeralds are green. Uh, and all the girls here know that the emeralds are green, right? Yeah. And um, then you have hypothesis two that all emeralds found till year 2020 are green, and then thereafter they are suddenly all blue. So both theories are absolutely consistent with all we know, right? But one is apparently ridiculous and the other one makes sense. But you know, we cannot say, well, this is obviously ridiculous. We need a formal, I mean, if we want an intelligent agent who comes up with this conclusion, we need a formal rule, yeah, or at least first principle. And so what is the difference between hypothesis two and hypothesis one? So with this simple example, this one example, you could argue, oh, there's a time the 2020 and you should not allow that, but then you know the phenomena which change over time, you know. Our sun existed for billions of years, so it should, should exist also for, you know, infinite, for the infinite future, but that is not true. I mean, it will explode at some day, yeah. So there are some, some events in the future sometimes, yeah. So, and um, the real difference between these two hypotheses is that the first one is simple. Yeah? It's that simple, okay. And that's the reason why we prefer it and why we should prefer it, okay. Um, but um, there's one problem now with this principle. Uh, we need to judge the simplicity of theories or the complexity of theories. Yeah. And what is simple for me may be complex for you or vice versa. Yeah. So we need a quantification of the concept of simplicity. Um, luckily, this has been done. But before I can come to that, um, we need um, the concept of computability and of general purpose computers, which has been formalized by Alan Turing um, in his work, which David Dow already talked about. Um, in the form of universal Turing machines. Yeah. And the important point is that there is a single Turing machine and a universal Turing machine which can compute all other computable processes. Okay. And the church Turing thesis, so he said that um, everything computable by a human using a fixed procedure can also be computed by a universal Turing machine. Okay. So, and, okay, so what is nice about this Turing machine. Or in Turing's time, it was a great insight that there's a single device which can simulate all other devices. Yeah. Um, but now we are um, nearly 80 years later, uh, 70 years later, um, or 65 or whatever, and um, do we still need this universal Turing machine? We have real computers which have all the power. Yeah. But the beauty of the universal Turing machine is that this device is so simple yeah, and still can do everything what you laptop can do, and it's so simple that we can mathematically study it, while a real PC is a mess, yeah. it will be much more difficult. Okay, um, so having the concept of Turing machine or computer device, we can now formally define complexity, and that's done in the field of algorithmic information theory, uh, has been quantified by Kolmogorov and others, yeah, usually referred to as Kolmogorov complexity. And what you do is the following. Um, take some data. Yeah? And nowadays data is usually stored on hard drive, so you can think about a binary string anyway. Okay. So if data is a binary string, you ask, is this a complex string or is it a simple string? So well, if you look at the string and it's one, 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 one billion ones, well, it's pretty simple, right? Yeah. If it's one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, it's also simple. 
you look at a very long program, Microsoft Windows hex dump or something like that, you know, that looks complicated. Okay. Um, why is one simple, or why do you regard one simple? It's simple, and the other one is complex. The reason is that for the sequence of all ones, you have a very short description, the one billion ones. Yeah. Or if you have the digits of pi, you know, okay, these are one billion digits of pi. Very simple description. While if you have a big software piece or real data, there's no such simple description. Okay? So it's natural to use the description length as a complexity measure, like with the Gouin paradox, right? And so how can we formalize it? There are many description languages. So we don't really want to use English or something informal. We want to use something formal. And OK, what is a language? You could say a language is a program that if I run it, yeah, it reproduces my data. Because reproducing data means describing this data. Print one billion ones. That's a description of my data. Okay? And um, then you formalize it and say it should run this program on a universal terrain. And now there are, of course, many programs which describe X. I could just say print quotation mark X quotation mark, right? Yeah. Very long program. But maybe there are better programs like this, looping programs, which you know, loops and prints and swans. Okay. So we look for the program which is shortest. Okay. We take the length of this program, and there are many programs which describe X, and we use the shortest one. And we call that the length of the Kolmogorov complexity of X. And I don't know time, so to go into that, but. Um, this has amazing properties, and in a sense, this is the best possible description of complexity. Okay, next, what do we need else? I put you know, in a couple of slides, I put everything together. So next thing what we need is we have an agent who has some beliefs about the world. So he doesn't know the world perfectly, he doesn't know everything, so he holds some beliefs. Now he has some new observation, so he has to update its belief. It holds some beliefs, so maybe extraterrestrials exist, with 80% probability. And now comes some radio signals, say a sequence of prime numbers. It could be natural origin, but it's unlikely. So it really increases my belief in extraterrestrials. So yeah, increase it. Yeah. Um, so we need a system to update beliefs. Yeah. And Bayesian probability is the perfect theory for that. So what is done here, you have a prior belief over your models or your hypothesis. Then comes new data B. And the update rule just says um, you take the product, normalize it, and then you get your first theory belief, the probability, the belief in H given you new data B. And then you have new data, and you use the rule again, you update and update it. Okay. So that's all great, but Bayes doesn't tell you with which belief you should start. And that is, of course, crucial too. We need to you know, start our H in some way. And this was the great insight of Solomonov, which comes to the next slide. Um, before I can come to that, I need another philosophical principle, um, the Epicurus principle. And um, so Occam said, um, choose the simplest theory which is consistent with your data. Well, suitably interpreted. Yeah. And Epicurus said, keep all theories which are consistent with your data. Right? So you have some contradiction here, right? But we can solve that easily. And the solution is, we just refine Occam by Epicurus. We keep all theories around, but we have a bias towards the simpler theories. The simpler theories are more likely to be good, correct, useful, whatever. Okay? And um, how do we do with bias? And we say our a priori belief in our in a hypothesis should be 2 to the minus the complexity of this hypothesis. Okay? So if it's complex the hypothesis, we don't believe much in it. But if it's simple, we believe a lot. Okay, that's the prior belief. Uh, and a priori, any hypothesis is reasonable. But then, if you have data, then this prior belief converts into posterior belief, and then the data clearly contradicts the hypothesis, then this factor is zero, and it gets ruled out. Yeah. So if you look at the posterior, we still have a bias towards simple theories, but only those which are still consistent with our data. Okay. And now Solomonov put everything together in the 1960s, David Lowe already talk about that um, into his formal theory of induction. And um, well, you could just take this prior, plug it into base rule, and that's more or less it. But there's a different representation which is remarkable. What you do is you take a, a universal <coughs> machine or general purpose computer, and instead of putting a program on the input tape, you put random noise on the input tape. 
And then you ask, what does this Turing machine do? And you ask, what is on the output tape? Well, if randomness is on the input tape, there will be some randomness on the output tape. But if uniform, if the, rand if the bits are uniformly distributed on the input tape, they will have a different distribution on the output tape. And indeed, this distribution is very, very remarkable. So I think it's called M of X. M of X is the probability that a universal Turing machine with random noise on the input tape output X. And if you then use this probability distribution for making predictions, so you have, say, observed weather, sun, sun, rain, sun, 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 rain, what comes tomorrow, or stock market went up, up, down, down, up, 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 what comes next, or any more complicated scenario, and you use this M of X for predictions, so you plug in your past knowledge and you ask what comes next, you can show that this is the best possible predictor which exists. And as always, sort of, I'm interpreting the formal theories, you know, the conditions, but they are really very powerful, very general. Um, so you could think, well, if you have this theory, I use it for the stock market and make predictions and become rich. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, like the world complexity, it is also incomputable. Uh, so we have to um, approximate that. I can come back to that later. Okay, so far so good. Now we have a universal theory of making optimal predictions, which is great. Yeah. But that's not the whole story. If you have an agent which makes predictions, that is great, but you should do something. But now we can try to predict the future world and act upon it. So it thinks, well, if I do this and this and this, what will happen probably in the future? It takes this M and sees this happens. Okay? And then if I take this sequence of actions, what will happen? And that is called sequential decision theory, optimal control theory. So you have, again, a sequence of observations. And then at time t, you make some decision. You have a new observation. And then you suffer some loss. Yeah. Or economists are more positive. You have some gain. Yeah. Uh, that's just a minus sign mathematically. No real difference. Right? And then you go to step one, and you repeat. And the goal of the agent, so the goal of the economical agent, is to maximize profit, yeah, and the goal of this um, abstract age is to minimize loss. Um, that works great, this sequential decision theory, as you see in the textbooks, if you have a perfect theory of your environment, or at least sufficiently good. The problem is for a real agent in a complex environment on Mars or something, we don't have that. So we cannot directly use this theory. But what we can do is well, we don't have the true distribution, but let's replace that by Solomonov's distribution, M of X. M of X is so good a predictor, yeah, maybe it also works well in the decision theory example. And indeed, this turns out to be the case. Okay? So here's the general agent framework now. You have this agent um, which performs some action, which was Y on the previous slide, and then the environment which gives the agents a new observations was X on the previous slide, sorry for the change of notation. And uh, then the environment provides occasional reward, which was the loss. So here, positive again, um, the rewards, OK? Um, which can be positive or negative. And um, the cycle continues. So and if you put all these philosophical theories and the mathematical theories together, what we get is the IC theory, the IC model. Okay? So we can put all this into a similar equation and you may think, well, this equation, we have seen simpler equations, right? Yeah. Um, but um, what it claims, namely to be a formal definition of um, rational actions and that it's the most intelligent agent possible, um, for this, you know, it's pretty simple, right? Yeah. You'll probably feel embarrassed, you know, if this would be in your head, right? Yeah. It's really simple. Huh? I mean, this is not in your head, yeah evolve evolutionary and you know we are more limited um, but so from a mathematical point of view um, this is um, a very powerful super intelligent agent and you can prove all that and well if you want to see the proofs you can look them up in my book or in various papers distributed yeah? um, but you should have a pretty mathematical mind for that yeah so five or ten five month course in university should be sufficient yeah or if you're not inclined to read all this math there's a great um, book is based on the PhD thesis of Shane Legg, Machine Superintelligence. Um, this actually won um, the Singularity Award in 2008. Um, so the Singularity um, crowd so thinks that um, this is something to contribute to the Singularity. And they will talk tomorrow about the Singularity.
And so this is very well written um, and very readable, so you, know, you can put it besides of your bed. Probably not. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of time to explain the situation. Um, so this here is Solomonov's M of X learning part, and this here is the decision theory part. So what goes on here? Um, first, forget here um, this end part. Um, so this agent wants to do optimal actions, but we all know greedy actions are not always good. You know, if I eat you know, all my sweets today, I feel very bad tomorrow. Yeah? Um, so I should plan ahead a little bit, or best you know, a long way into the future. So we need some planning part. If we play chess, that's also clear. So this is this planning part. If you know how chess works, um, or computer chess, I mean, you have this minimax tree search. Um, that works well if you assume that your environment is adversarial. Yeah. But nature is not that mean. Yeah, it's not always adversarial. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it is cooperative. In general, you can generalize that. So environment is a stochastic world which reacts somehow to our actions. So instead of having a minimax tree search, you have an expected max tree. So you still want to maximize your reward, but the agent acts probabilistically. So here's where the sums of the maximization operators. So this is current time k. And they say where the agent dies for simplicity. So let's say this in 80 years. And then you sum, these sums are expectations over the possible future observation that we want. That is all fine if I would, OK, so what do I want to maximize? I want to maximize future reward. That is this here from current cycle k to cycle m. That is all fine if I had a probabilistic distribution model of my world, I would plug it in here, and it would do the job, and I would have standard sequential decision tree. But I don't have this model, so I replace this model by Solomonov's distribution suitably extended, and this is the extension. So what does this distribution do? Um, so you have here the universal Turing machine, and Q are the models of the world. And we look for models Q, which if I simulate this model based on the past actions and the past observation rewards, it is consistent with what I know. So I only take those models of the world which are consistent with my knowledge. So that is Epicorus principle, take all theories which are consistent with your data. But then we want a bias towards simplicity. And we say, well, if a model, which is a program here, is short, then we give it a high weight in this mixture. And otherwise, we give it a small way. So this is a mixture of all worlds which are consistent with what I know. So, and that's it. So everything is explicit here. You can talk about the spaces, which is not so important. You can binarize them, or take a camera image, and, and the normal robotic output. Um, you choose some universal Turing machine. So the only thing which is not explicitly written out here is you. You use a universal Turing machine for everything else. Explicit. And um, as I said, so the claim is, and you can prove that, that this is the most intelligent agent possible. Okay. Um, so far, so good. But it's only a mathematical theory. And you can prove that, but you cannot do anything with it. It's similar to quantum and electrodynamics. I mean, you can simulate a hydrogen atom, but also, I mean, only with approximation. That's it. Yeah, in order to do something with it, you need approximations. And um, the same is true here. And I will talk a little bit about these approximations now. Um, so general additional requirements and ingredients needed for approximating universal AI for the IC body in particular, but also it's more generically if you, if you approach AGI from a theoretical aspect. And then a particular successful approximation, the Monte Carlo ICCPW approximation, um, then some other approach, um, and then I put everything in. OK, so what do we need in addition to the ingredients I've told you already in order to make this computable? Um, so AI, or at least traditional AI, is a lot about search. You have this planning problem, which are search problems. Yeah? And the same is true here. This expected max is a huge search problem. And um, there are, of course, heuristic search algorithms, but usually they're tailored toward a particular application, and they are limited or they want a universal general agent. So are there some universal search techniques? And indeed there is. It's called universal Levin search. Uh, Levin invented that in the 70s, and Schmidt, who pioneered and practical approximations of that. 
Okay, well, that's all. Okay. Um, then we need learning. I mean, Solomonov is a theoretical optimal learner, but it's incomputable. But machine learning, you know, mentioned that already, you know, is around, and uh, it's a great success story. And um, in particular, the reinforcement learning part of machine learning is, is, is very important. Um, information theory uh, for um, um, for doing one version of learning. So Kolmogorov complexity says you should take the shortest program, uh, which describes your data. You cannot find the shortest program. But what we could do is we could take standard compressors which are on your PC, like Lambda SIF, yeah, and use them, create self-extracting archives. And what is a self-extracting archive? Self-extracting archive is a program which I run on a general purpose computer, which reproduces my original file, right? Yeah. So it is not the very shortest one, but it's a shorter one. And you know, the better the compressors get, the shorter these files are by definition, and the closer we get to the of complexity. Okay. And um, so uh, the minimum measured length principle, which has been pioneered by uh, Chris Wallers and then followed up by David Dow in Melbourne and the NDL principle, um, they use um, this compression idea and information theory in order to do model selection, to learn good models. Um, so then AI in general and um, universal AI is also a lot about optimization. Right? You want to find you know, the best action, which is an optimization problem. You have many possible actions. You want to find the best. Yeah? And um, there are many optimization algorithms out there for many different problems and um, so here uh, I listed some you know textbooks in these different areas um, and Monte Carlo is a general idea of well if I can, can't do exhaustive search I just sample a subsample and hope for the best um, uh, which is very powerful and very successful so I don't have time to go into all these details so um, what I will do is um, I will not even explain you how this approximation of IC works so so for the experts here, um, the, the expected max tree, we used the UCT, which was very successful in computer Go for approximating the planning part. And the compression part, we use um, state-of-the-art compressor or a mathematical mm -hmm. version, which is called context free rating. And we just plug it in and does approximations. And then we interface this single agent, I stressed it several times, it's a single agent with the world of tic-tac-toe, the world of cool poker, the world of Pac-Man and see what happens. So this agent, a priori, has no knowledge about these worlds. It doesn't even know the rules of the games. But by interacting with these games and getting reward for eating food pellets and getting punished for being um, uh, running into a ghost or for winning tic-tac-toe games and so on, yeah, it will learn, I mean, first it will learn how the world works, and then it will learn what is good to do, how to collect the world. And indeed, what you can show from these graphs, yeah, um, that um, it learns perfectly um, to play tic-tac-toe, um, it learns to play uh, cool poker perfectly, and it learns to play Pac-Man, let's say, somewhat reasonably. Okay. Um, and I mean, the smaller toy boards, it learns perfectly. So what is impressive about this chart is, you know, we can play chess, you know, better than the best human, and, you know, here I'm talking about tic-tac-toe, yeah. But the difference is um, Deep Blue has been designed to play chess and a lot of expert knowledge went in. Here, no domain knowledge went in. It's a general purpose compressor with a general purpose Monte Carlo search. And still it is able to learn a variety of admittedly much simpler games, but you know, ultimately, hopefully we're getting there to play chess. Okay. Um, so this is one approximation. Um, we have developed another approximation. Um, so, so this ICMC approximation is sort of a direct approximation. Yeah? Okay. So the next one is more inspired you know, by this theory. And here what we do is the following. So we have a complex real world problem on the one side, and then we have problems on the other side we can solve. So these problems are unsolvable. I mean, picture here. And then we have on the other side a row of problems which you can solve efficiently. And in the reinforcement learning domain, there's something called Markov decision processes, uh, which can be learned efficiently. 
And this class is embarrassingly primitive. Yeah? And you know, if you try to go a little bit beyond it, you cannot do much. I mean, you can go to structured indices that works sort of nicely. But so that's what we can do. That's what we want to do. And the idea is, um, well, let's reduce the real world problem to this solvable problem. I mean, that's what scientists do all day. But usually, you do that by hand. And the idea here is to do that automatically. And several questions then arise. I mean, first is how can we identify a good reduction? And if you just get a planning problem, you know, this problem is sort of easy. But if you have a learning and planning problem, and you have a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem, um, so it's not so easy. And here's the solution. What you do is, um, I think I want to go into that. So, I mean, you have the environment, which still provides observation and rewards. Then you evaluate your reduction, so this piece of reduction from the real world problem to the toy world which you can solve, um, which is then a market decision process. Then you can easily learn this. Um, you need to explore this world properly, and there are theories how to do that optimally. And um, then you get a value of your actions, and which leads to a policy and leads to some action, and then the cycle repeats. And um, so here we can solve, so this came much later, we can also solve the same problems like in Pac-Man, TikTok, and so on, but not more at the moment. Okay, um, so here is a general picture. So here is universal AI, uh, which is a field, and I see with this, this model. And um, so here is the MCI <coughs> approximation and the feature reinforcement learning I've just presented to you. And um, all of them, they are rooted in information theory, machine learning, stochastic planning, and complexity theory. So these are the four most important pillars. Yeah? And in order to sort of computationally address these problems, you need a lot of more. I mean, you need search algorithms, optimization algorithms, possibly for some problems, logic, knowledge representation, and so on. And um, yeah, and I have not, and I will not talk about all sort of these interface skills, but about robotics, vision, language. You know, um, in theory, you don't need it. You put the raw signals into IC, and it just gives you a raw output, and everything works. In practice, because of limited computational power, what you have to do is you have to take some sophisticated computer vision and simplify the input stream, and the same with the output. Okay. Um, so let me now go back and discuss uh, what I've talked about. Um, so I give you, gave you an informal definition uh, of intelligence, namely the agent's ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. And if I would go back now to this equation, you would see that this equation really captures this informal definition. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. The wide range of environments are computable environments. Um, to succeed or achieve goals is this reward function. Um, ability has been put in because maybe you fail because of unluck, right? That's fine, but you need the ability to succeed and so on. Okay? But still, then you ask, well, look, I think intelligence has something to do with reason or with creativity, or with association, or with generalization, or pattern recognition, problems, or memorization, planning, and the uncertainty, achieving goals, learning, integration, optimization, self-preservation, vision, natural language processing, and so on. Yeah? And this list is probably infinitely long. And um, yes, these are important aspects of intelligence. But the formal definition and the verbal definition, they don't seem to incorporate all of them. Right? Um, Memorization is built in. You remember the whole history of compressing. That's fine. Um, planning under uncertainty is built in into the expecting max three tick. Right? Yeah. But what is with this other? Learning is built in in the Solomonov distribution. It's not so clearly visible, but you rule out the wrong environments. That's also fine. Yeah? Achieving goals, yes, you want to maximize reward. You know, that is close enough. Yeah? Um, I talked about vision and language, that these are interface fields. Yeah? So but let's pick reasoning. Where's the reasoning going on? Look, I mean, this agent doesn't reason. It just compresses and it's just some expecting max planning. But clearly, you know, intelligence has something to do with reasoning, and that's not in there. OK, the answer to this is that all the other traits of intelligence must be emergent properties of this equation and this informal definition. And indeed, they are. I mean, I haven't verified all infinitely many, but many of them. So for instance, reasoning, where does this come in? So if you have a world you know, where reasoning about it is useful in order to acquire more reward and to be successful, yeah, then IXE will, because it is the optimal reward maximizer, will 
by necessity have to acquire these weakening skills. So then you can ask, well, okay, this is my claim, but you know, where's the evidence and where does it go on internally? Yeah. Okay, so there's this compression part. Yeah. So you take your data and you compress it as well as possible. And if you use current compressors, you know, it, it doesn't look like, you know, that there's a lot of intelligence going on. But if you want to compress better, you need smarter and smarter compressors. Yeah. You need a rich knowledge representation and reason about your data in order to be able to compress it. I mean, science is a complicated business. You have data, you want to analyze it. I mean, it's, it's very hard, yeah? And once you understand it, you've got the insight, oh, this model explains my data. Then you compress the data. So compressing the data really means trying reasoning about the data. So the reasoning is in the compression. And Kolmogorov complexity slides all this under the carpet because, well, I mean, there is an optimal solution, that's it. But if you develop practical compressors, yeah, you have to do this reasoning. Well, the reasoning part has to go in there. And, you know, I want to go uh, into all these items. Um, well, and then there may be aspects which are not so you know, about rationality. What is it about consciousness or self-awareness or sentience or emotions? You know, where is this in this IC theory? And, okay, there are two answers to that. So my goal was to build a perfectly rational agent. So I'm not primarily interested in things, but if these aspects help the agent to perform better, then they will emerge. Yeah? So for instance, self-awareness. You know, if uh, you reflect upon yourself you know, and upon your past actions, and that helps you to perform better in the future. So it's a very important feature uh, to be self-aware. Um, and so this will also happen in IC. Okay, I mean, this talks about the functional part and not about the qualia. Yeah. So, I mean, will I actually be really conscious, you know, and, and feel something? Okay. I don't know. I believe yes, yeah. Uh, I don't care too much, yeah, as long as it behaves appropriately. Okay, so now you can ask about, and so the beauty of this theory is, I mean, you can study theoretically and prove nice theorems. Um, you can approximate that, and we have some limited success. Yeah. Or you study some other questions. For instance, um, does IXE take drugs? Yeah. I mean, that's paraphrasing. Um, so that will it hack its reward system, for instance? Um, which is an interesting question. Um, some humans do it, most do not. Um, and the reason is because it has long-term negative consequences. So because it will also have long-term negative consequences for IXE, it will probably not take drugs. Right? And the, the nice thing is you can formalize this question, and you can answer that and rigorously prove that. And um, indeed, um, there have been recent papers by Laura so and others um, who take up these questions and try to formally solve them. And indeed, he came to the opposite conclusion, so he claims that IC will take drugs, yeah? um, which is bad. Yeah? Um, so we have to prevent that. But it can only do that in certain environments, in certain settings, and then it really became ultra powerful in order to have access to the remote signal. So below the human threshold, you know, um, we, we have a pretty good system. And above that, you know, all things can go wrong, and I will talk about that tomorrow. Um, and, well, there are other questions. Do we procreate? Um, yes, sort of, if, if IT believes, you know, that it's useful, you know, ensure the retirement engine or so. Yeah. Um, well, you can ask about suicide, yeah? So if you raise IC to believe in heaven, then the most rational action would be to commit suicide, right? Yeah. I mean, if I define heaven to be always having reward one, hell always having reward minus one, that would be the natural action. The question is whether you can convince IC about heaven, right? Yeah. I mean, he's so smart, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably have a tough time. Um, okay, I'll leave it like that. So, um, I repeat myself, the beauty with these mathematical theories, you can now ask, very, very difficult questions and come to formal conclusions. It's sort of a formal philosophy, mathematical philosophy. Okay. Um, so um, now you can ask how will a singularity look like? And well, if you talk about an intelligence explosion, then at the singularity we should have the most intelligent agents. And I told you that IC is this agent. So if all this is true, then, IXI, uh, then the singularity should be a societal axis, right? 
we have the Ix equation already, so we can study the singularity today. If, 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 if all this is correct. And we can, you know, we really solve these equations and we can do something that is very hard. And I will talk more about that tomorrow. Um, well, there's some generic questions, uh, which I think I can skip. Um, is this the right approach, or whether you should take the neurobiological approach, or whether you should combine it? Um, you know, will reward maximizers like IXC um, will be, they be benevolent or dangerous? Um, and all these questions can be asked, and some of them can be answered. And there are lots of scientific challenges, of course. Um, so uh, we need better practical approximations. I mean, one is to get faster hardware. You know, in 30 years, we have much faster hardware, but it, it will not help yet. IX is incomputable, and the current approximations are too primitive. Yeah? So there's still you know, research to do, rather than just waiting for faster hardware. Okay, and um, one final important um, point is that um, since IX is a reinforcement learner, you have to design training sequences. You wouldn't give it sort of, you wouldn't ask, you know, you switch it on and ask what is the meaning of life, right? Yeah? Uh, that's probably too hard. Yeah? You have to start with simpler problems, yeah, and then go up, you know, like you do with human ch children. Yeah? And um, you can devise better and worse training sequence to make it easier or harder for IC to learn. Um, so there has been very little research on, on this so far. Okay, let me summarize. Um, so theories are necessary <coughs> to guide our search for AGI, that is my claim. Um, I have gave you a definition of intelligence. I provided uh, a universal theory of AI. And IC is the most intelligent agent. And uh, the key ingredients were Occam, Epicurus, Space, Turing, Tomogoro, Solomonov, and Delvan. I've shown you two approximations um, with some practical um, success. And um, so the final line is that AGI research has become a form of science, which is, I think, great. Okay, and here's some. Thanks. We might have time for a couple of questions. So, anybody got any questions? And we done? Uh, on the question of drugs, just a, a short point. Is it the case that the assumption is that a drug reward system is more easily satisfied? than a non-drug reward system or requires less computation to satisfy it? Yeah, I mean, if you have a teacher, um, I mean, if you have a very benign teacher gives you all the positive reward, like it seems the modern school system is like, you know, then yeah. there's no point in taking drugs. But if you have a teacher who is a little bit tough, you know, then it's easier to just to take drugs to be happy. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Could I actually choose to take a drug that would actually increase the complexity Ah, uh, yeah, okay. I'm not, you know, this is just, I've used the word drug for being happy yeah. and not to increase the complexity. So, so this is a different question. Would IXC, uh, an embodied IXC, be interested in improving its body or its brain? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the answer is most likely yes. There are interesting sub-questions. For instance, would IXC be motivated to change its own goals? Mm -hmm. yeah? And there seems to be a clear no. Uh, we can discuss it offline. Why? Um, so, Pac-Man is the most complicated environment of, of these. I mean, tic-tac-toe is fairly easy, and cool poker is a very, very simplified form of poker. Um, and um, we made it, in a sense, harder than a normal player. A normal player can view the whole board, and IT was only allowed to see the local surroundings. Yeah. Um, so, if it would see the whole board, but it caused other technical problems, yeah. <laughs> that's the reason why we didn't, yeah. um, then it would play better. Yeah, the reward function comes from um, usually having mind from the environment. Yeah. So, so my at least original goal was to build intelligent systems which are useful to us. Yeah. So we should teach them what to do. So it's a teacher with a carrot and a stick. But um, you could also think of you know you want to put a robot on Mars. You know there's no teacher around. Yeah. Then you would plug the reward into say how full is the battery, how well are its organs working, how many rocks. And did it collect and so on? Then you would hardwire the rewards to something else, or you could have a combination of both. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Uh, just in bits, I express it in binary and then number of bits. Yeah, I use a universal Turing machine. So a uni universal Turing machine has a binary input tape, binary output tape, binary program on the input tape, and you know all programs are already in binary. Then you could ask which universal Turing machine I should I choose, and. Um, so the short answer is you should choose a reasonable universal Turing machine, and um, it's quite obvious what is reasonable, what is not. So if you choose a universal Turing machine, um, which has sort of or Wikipedia as background knowledge hidden somewhere in the state space, this you know screws things up. Yeah. Um, so take Turing's original universal Turing machine, but I mean you don't have to take Turing machines. You can take the lambda calculus, the cellular automata. Yeah? Take anything simple, right, and, and fix it once and for all. And the difference in the results you have are of finite time. So one system may need a couple of more interactions to learn than if you base it on a different universal Turing machine, and this difference depends on the compiler constant of compiling programs from one language to another. So any questions, if you want more detailed answers, I guess we can discuss it in the panel then. Right? Yes. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you.